Well, lad, well, it's not every day you get one of the greats on the podcast, but today is one of those days as a genuine legend joins me for this one. He's played for Auckland, he's played for the Blues, and of course he's won two Rugby World Cups with the All Blacks, and he's widely regarded as one of the greatest loose forwards in All Black history. He's also had a stint in Japan with two of her blitz, and he's recently retired from rugby after helping to lose, win the Champions Cup and the top 14 double. But above all the wins and accolades, he's an absolute lad who's had a massive impact on so many guys' careers, it is, of course, the one and only Jerome Kaino. Welcome, brother. Hey, brother. Thanks for having me on, man. Mate, absolute privilege to have a legend on like yourself. And it's been a massive morning for the Marshall household. We just opened the Wheat Bix box and the boys pull out the Jerome Kaino legend <laughs> card. What a morning. <laughs> oh, awesome. <laughs> How does it feel to be put on that sort of list with, I think there's only like 10 sort of guys and you're one of the, the legends that, I guess, Sanitarium have chosen to be one of the greatest All Blacks of all time. Man, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, I just, uh, I saw the Sky TV or Sky Sports uh, uh, greatest All Blacks side and, um, you know, there's some legends on that side, but uh, to even hear my name uh, be spoken in the same sentence as the likes of uh, Richie McCaw and Michael Jones, so Michael Jones, it's uh, it's quite humbling, but um, yeah, to, to be able to, Having to be able to play one test for the All Blacks was a was a dream come true. But uh, to be in there for as long as I was, it was, uh, it was incredible. Mate, how good's that? And so the boots are all hung up now. Are you, are you getting itchy feet? The season started. You're wishing you're back, still back out there playing, or you had enough? Absolutely not, mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> rocking up with the coaching staff for preseason and seeing the cones set out for the Broncos. Uh, yeah. Did not get a chief feet. It was uh, it was quite enjoy- enjoyable just sitting there and watching the boys do the do the hard yards pre season. How is your body now? Oh, it's feeling pretty good. I I do get uh, the odd aches in the joints every now and then from being uh, a bit inactive, but um, uh, with with the staff and all of the players still being in the gym, it gives me a bit of uh, incentive to get out there and and uh, do a bit of exercise every now and then. But um, I guess that's the that's the drive at the moment to try not to to go for as long and not not do any exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you found it hard to stay motivated to exercise? I, I know I've personally found that really hard. Well, I kind of enjoyed it uh, for the first uh, seven weeks, seven eight weeks, just to not do anything. But when you get up and you get a uh, you're aching back and uh, the knees are starting to ache from doing nothing. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, you kind of have to find that motivation to get out there and try and stay active uh, just to keep away the, the aches and pains. Mm, far, fair enough. And so you've transitioned pretty seamlessly into coaching now, eh? So um, got to lose off to a hissing start, three from three. So, mate, you're doing something right there. Oh, mate, it's, uh, I'm, I'm in the learning phase, learning process, uh, trying to get my head around um the structures and how how to how the coaches uh, um, do things. So for me, it uh, for the next few months or so at least is just to try and find my position or my my groove within the coaching staff. And it's it's been awesome. I'm learning lots every day and off the players and the staff. But uh, it's it's not from any of my doing that the boys have uh, <laughs> uh, got off to a really good start. I, I think that. Um, Having the core players uh, return back in uh, good shape and and still having those combinations together from last year, it's uh, it's really helped us a lot and and it's a uh, testament to the coaching staff as well who have uh, tried to adapt things and uh, change the way we play so that we don't come too predictable. But um, touch wood, hopefully the the momentum and the and the mojo continues. Mm, mate, you guys have a really talented squad there, eh? Yeah, oh, we we speak about golden ages of certain countries, and I think uh, France, French rugby, are, uh, are entering through their their golden spot. They've got some awesome talent, a lot of depth in certain positions, but um, definitely their key players, uh, uh, some of the best in the world, uh, to name a few: Romain Intermac and uh, Antoine Dupont, who we're quite lucky to have in our squad. And, Though, though these guys are like 22, 23, 24, and um, mate, the way they play and the way they hold themselves, it's uh, it's incredible. And they're going to be on the international stage for years to come now, which is uh, which is good to uh, sit back and watch. 
Mm. And you got a few good Kiwi boys with you over there as well too, haven't you? Yeah, uh, we've got Peter Aki, Joe Takori, Charlie Fongwina, uh, Tim Nana Williams just joined our, our squad this year, yeah, which so. is uh, which is awesome. And we've got a lot of great uh, younger players as well. But uh, those those first few that I named, uh, I think they were the, the backbone of our, our team last year. I think Peter Aki should have been the, or would have been our, the player of the tournament, uh, top 14 last oh, yeah. year. He was just, it was incredible for us, and um, the way he's been playing, and uh, and will continue to do this year. But um, uh, it's just incredible how the team have been able to gel together um, and and put up the performances and have the year that we had last year was uh, it was awesome. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. Peter Key's carving it up over there. He's come a long way from his um, pit a pit sponsorship at the Hurricanes. Where yeah. <laughs> I know he suffered a lot of injury with injuries when he was here in New Zealand. So it's mate, it's awesome seeing him um, living up to his potential because he was always a really talented player. Eh? Yeah, I was lucky to spend a, a few years with him at the Blues when I came back from Japan and. Um, he was always uh, like an incredible player. Had the X factor, just. Uh, the injuries that he was unlucky to have, and which is uh, awesome to see here in France. He's been able to manage through some niggles, but uh, it's really important for our, our team and our club that he's always out there. And, and last year, he was always out there putting out the performances. And um, yeah, he's definitely been um, one to watch for the last few years. Mm. And was coaching always the transition you wanted to get into is that what you always wanted to do after rugby was that the plan it wasn't at the top of my list uh, like for me I never really wanted to just fall into coaching because it was uh it's all I know yeah like I've been in, in rugby for so many years and I always wanted to explore other things but with the way the world's been panning out for the last uh, couple of years and um also returning back home uh seemed a bit of a headache um, for me and my family. Mm. Uh, the opportunity came up uh, when we were reassessing what was going to happen the next few years and the club approached me about uh, staying on and, and uh, trying out coaching and also working with the academy here. Uh, for me, it was, it was awesome. I always wanted to head back home and either work with uh, uh, schools or within rugby and uh, the community and this fell right in, uh, into what I wanted to do. So um, instead of creating a headache, headache for ourselves and shipping everything back home uh, while the world's uh, the way it is, uh, it made more sense to, to settle the kids in for the next few years and learn a different language, learn a different culture and experience this side of the world where, while, while we can. And how are the family finding it over there? Do they love the French lifestyle? Well, the kids love it. Uh, they're in a great, they're in great schools, great friends around, and and like you said, we've got a, a great group of uh, expats, foreigners here, which uh, which helps a lot. Um, uh, they're really enjoying learning uh, French, and my daughter's uh, got a lot of Spanish friends as well, and and she's learning Spanish, uh, which is which is awesome. She's learning at a faster pace than uh, than I am. <laughs> But uh, no, the, the family are enjoying it, which uh, made my decision to, to take up the role um, a lot easier. Yeah, that's cool. So how is your French? Do you have to speak French now that you're a coach or you just speak uh, English with a translator? Oh, I'm, I'm really pushing to try and uh, become as fluent as I can. I can, I can understand the majority of the conversations and uh, what, what everyone's saying. It's just a matter of putting my my sentences together and, and having the confidence to reply. But where I'm at at the moment, it's it's uh, probably 80% English and, and 20% French, which uh, isn't good enough for the amount of time I've been here, but um, it's, it's a tough language to pick up and, and to, to try and speak. But um, I'm really enjoying the process to try, try and learn and, and uh, become as fluent as I, I should be as a coach. Can you, can you speak some on? Yeah, yeah, I can speak some more fluently. True. And how did you go at, in with Japanese when you're in Japan? So you've you've obviously got a little bit of all these languages in your head. Yeah, well, I found Japanese a lot easier than uh, French True. because yeah. uh, the, the vowels are similar to like, Samoan and Maori, mm. and and in most cases, one word would mean one thing, and and 
a certain context where we're here in France. Uh, one word can change from past tense, uh, present tense, feminine, yeah. masculine, and it, uh, yeah, it gets a pretty com complicated uh, trying to structure your sentences. But uh, I guess that's the the fun of uh, trying to learn a different language. Hundred percent. Anyway, mate, obviously a massively successful career, so I'm pretty keen to hear it from the start. What was, what was it like for you um, growing up in Auckland? Man, it was cool. Um, uh, growing up in Papakura, we, uh, I, I had a group of friends where we would always play touch after school uh, at the local park. And um, Man, I, I tried all sorts of sports, volleyball, basketball, athletics, um, uh, you name it, we did it. And it's, uh, it was just a normal, uh, classic Kiwi kid uh, upbringing where, where you'd, you'd be, always be active. But um, no, I loved it, and um, my I think my first love was either athletics or rugby league because uh, my household would always be glued to the TV on Friday nights watching uh, either the Canberra Raiders or or the Manly Sea Eagles, which were my um, favourite teams growing up. And uh, it was always rugby league. Uh, wasn't until the test matches, all black test matches were on that's when we'd watch rugby, but uh, rugby league was the first uh, game I always uh, wanted to watch and always watched. Um, it wasn't until uh, later in high school when all my mates would be playing uh, either first of 10 or under 16 to rugby, which uh, made me uh, want to make the switch mm -hmm. just, to, just so I could play with my mates. True. You must have been... Uh dominant at a young age were you you would have just been bigger stronger faster than everyone were you? you would have you would have been a nightmare to play against as a kid i'd imagine no i um i played in the backs oh, uh, earlier on i was a fullback center uh the odd time at first five but i was useless at kicking <laughs> i couldn't, couldn't kick but um yeah i was a skinny beanpole yeah oh hell i was really fast but um, it wasn't until my second to last year at high school when I got a scholarship to St. Kent's um, where my coach, Tim Connolly at the time, uh, mentioned uh, uh, you should try it, Lewis Ford, you're getting a bit big and I started to fill out. And uh, I tried it and uh, stayed there ever since. Right. So I'm quite thankful for my first 15 coach to, to, to offer me the... The position to switch and uh man i loved it ever since and you had a stacked team at st kent's that year too didn't you weren't you playing with rokotoko and john arfoa yeah. obviously yourself yeah all getting paid big bucks <laughs> is the rumor no <laughs> you need to squash this rumor this question came in a few times <laughs> man was, i'm sure it's all those often grammar king's college <laughs> haters that uh said we were getting paid but uh no we were we we're all quite lucky to to move over to st kent's at the same time from south auckland and yeah we had some awesome players uh uh at that time and um i was very lucky to get that opportunity because um uh, my focus at school and at papakura wasn't really uh the best but uh i think the switch to st kent's uh, came at the right time to, to focus on school work and also uh, give rugby a, a decent decent nudge. Mm. Were you thinking rugby as a job at this time? No, no, no it was uh, it wasn't really in my head to give it. A, it was more focused around schoolwork and and to focus. And rugby was also part of it to to, to make sure that I I could give it a good go if it was going to work for me or not. Mm. But um, no, it wasn't on the radar to become a, a professional rugby player or even uh, play NPC at that time because I still wasn't too sure if I was even uh, made up for, for rugby because I was still either playing in the backs or just moving into the forwards and yeah. still trying to find my spot. But 100% uh, we weren't getting paid to go to school. <laughs> we, can that you that. Rumor. we can squash that rumour. <laughs> Name and shame that person. <laughs> 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 but anyway, you you obviously were a talented player, and then you ended up making the New Zealand Colts. You became the you were the player of the tournament when you went away to the Rugby World Cup. So you progressed through the ranks pretty quickly, eh? Yeah, I was uh, I was quite lucky straight out of school. I um, I spent uh, two years with uh, Titch at his training camps and, uh, and doing those infamous uh, <laughs> training camps out of, in Palmerston North, which were 
it was hell. But uh, for me as a young kid, just trying to know what it takes to, to I, I learned work ethic and uh, what, what it need, what I needed to have to be a professional rugby player. And geez, it wasn't easy. Um, I spent two years in in the system and never got a never got a tournament. True. Was that just because of fitness? Because I know Willis Halaholo mentioned that he beat your beep test record. For the worst ever. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's not that hard to beat my my big test record. Uh, <laughs> no, he was worse. He got the worst one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, it was hell. We'd we'd do uh, like one fifties, uh, the phosphate test, and then a fifteen minute break, and then you go do the beep test. Yeah. And I was wrecked by the Brutal. time we were warming up. To the- do the beat test so there was there wasn't much of a score there to <laughs> to brag about but yeah it was uh those were some tough uh dark days uh spending with titch and and working there but um no i really enjoyed it um coming out of that uh moving into 15s i, I felt like i was quite uh prepared to and and fit enough to to give it a good go and i was still at still at a young age um, at that time, which was uh, which was awesome. What was that sevens environment like? Were because there would have been some uh, pretty big dog sevens players back then. Were they all were they all really good to you coming in there? As a you must have been what eighteen nineteen. Yeah, no, it was an awesome setup. Um, a great bunch of guys and uh, like the sevens environment. It's it's quite uh, they, it's quite unique, and they have their own little um, little things or ways that they. They make it unique to other New Zealand teams, but uh, at that time there was Ed Koka, Tafa Iwasa, Orini Ai, uh, Liam Messam, and Tani Rauletame were mm. were um, starring on those teams as well. So, um, mate, just uh, Eric Rush as well. True. So, oh, Marcia, Marcia Valance. So to be training with those guys uh, most weekends was uh, it was incredible. Um, um, just seeing how they went about their work and uh, what they needed to do to, to be the best because they were winning back-to-back uh, World Series at that, at that time and uh, it was just incredible to be in and around that environment. Did that give you the confidence in yourself that when you went to this Under-21 World Cup that you were ready and you, you were definitely good enough? Yeah, well, of course. Um, when, you, when you're in uh, coaches, uh, Titch, Titch's system, um, you knew that uh, what you were doing in the sessions and what you were doing around the environment, no one else was working as hard as you were. Um, and you could guarantee that the way the boys were uh, uh, training and uh, and working. So for me, moving out of that and going into the under 21s, under 19s, under 21s, and even the Auckland system, I knew that I'd, I was prepared well enough to... to give whatever team it was to give it a good crack and to be the best I could be in those environments. So, yeah, leaving the sevens uh, kind of prepared me for anything pretty mm. much and uh, which uh, gave me that confidence to just go out there and express myself because I know it, I'd done the work. And when you'd won all these awards like Player of the Year, I think you won the New Zealand Junior Player of the Year or something as well, did that give you more confidence or did that add pressure? Did you start feeling the expectation was on you to... Um, succeed in footy? Oh, I'd say it gave me confidence, but uh, yeah, like you said, on the other hand, it did add a bit of pressure because you're still young mm. and then you're moving into uh, 15 aside rugby where uh, a lot of guys are established, but uh, your name's being bandied around um, as being the next best thing, and you know that those guys are looking at you looking to. To prove a point, yeah. so yeah, it did add a bit of pressure to, to go out there and perform. But um, I was young enough, and I, I don't think I really cared too much about pressure. I just wanted to get out there and get my chance mm. to to prove myself. And you did that pretty much straight away for the Auckland side, eh? Um, made an instant impact in there. Well, I was. Uh, I think that first year for me, just uh, Training alongside Carlos Spencer and guys I used to have on a poster on my wall yeah. <laughs> a couple of years before. Being in and around that environment, uh, man, I think I spent the first year just uh, pinching myself and be- uh, just not being able to believe that I'm training with these guys and uh, rocking up to meetings with them. And it was uh, it was pretty surreal. It was cool. Um, 
I speak to my dad about it all the time. We used to get the the Auckland or Blues posters out of the Herald uh, every year, and um, I used to always put it up on the in the hallway at home, and and to be running out and training with them, and even doing that poster shoot with them, I used to tell them that. Geez, uh, I used to watch you guys on. Uh, I used to stare at that poster all the time, and and uh, now I'm here doing it with you guys. It was yeah. that was crazy, and I'm sure a lot of guys go through that mm. sim- uh, similar memory. But uh, for me, it was uh, it was incredible. Mm. And what were the guys like when you went into the environment? Because one thing that's probably come up a few times throughout this podcast is how good you've been for young guys who have come into the All Blacks or come into the Auckland environment at making them feel comfortable. So yeah. did someone do this to you when you went in or did you have the opposite where you felt like you needed to maybe um, make more of an effort in that space? Yeah, I, I think I had to make more of an effort when I was in that, uh, uh, when I first came in because there are a lot of older <laughs> Older established All Blacks in there, like Case Muse, Carlos yeah. Spencer, and um, I think Lee Stensness was still playing at that time. But um, I, I had Kevin Malamu and uh, Irani Clark who were there at the time as well. They uh, they took me in and they always made me comfortable wherever I was. Uh, being a young guy, I was like a deer in headlights, always wondering when the next meeting is, <laughs> if I'm going to miss a uh, training time, and. Uh, yeah, I was always reassured by those guys, and and um, to to make sure that I, I just be myself. And uh, yeah, going through going through those uh, periods, I always made sure that when I when I'm a senior player and I ever get the chance to to take a younger guy under my wing, then I want to make sure that they're as comfortable as they can, just to express themselves. Because uh, you you'd see it, you'd see some young kids come in and kind of keep to themselves and. You're not too sure whether they're comfortable enough to fully, fully uh, express themselves wherever they are. So mm. I just wanted to make kids uh, or younger guys comfortable enough to be able to say, oh, I'm just going to be me and uh, not worry about anything else. It's so cool because it makes a massive difference. Eh? And it doesn't take much for, for you as a senior player to make someone feel comfortable. You just have to go up and maybe say a word or something, eh? but it can have a massive yeah. impact on some of these young guys' uh, careers. Eh? Yeah, exactly. But then the All Blacks, the same year. So one year in the Auckland item, oh, MPC side, you're saying you're still yeah. feeling like a deer in the headlights and just called straight into the All Black team. Eh? Yeah. Talk to me about being named in that side initially and then what it was like in the camp. Man, that came out of um, nowhere. I, I, um, I'd been to, Gold, to the Gold Coast with my, uh, with my girlfriend, uh, oh, my wife now. And uh, I think that time while we were in the Gold Coast, they slowly put together a, like a short list of players they were trying to contact. And uh, I don't think anyone could get hold of me. So I got back to New Zealand to... Uh, Two days later, and then they named the All Blacks, and uh, I, I had no clue, no idea what what was uh, going on until I got a message after the team got named saying uh, congratulations. So, yeah, it was it was strange. It just came out of nowhere. I didn't think I played well enough to to get into the All Blacks, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was a weird feeling. I kind of felt like, do I deserve to be here or? Uh, uh, did I play well enough? But uh, for me, it was a dream come true, and uh, I didn't really worry too much about what what I'd done to get there. I just wanted to make sure that when I get in there, I make it uh, make the most of the opportunity. Because um, yeah, like I've said before about the other teams, there are some absolute legends in their team, and to to use that time to learn from them and hopefully get back into there when I when I ever get the chance. Mm. So you were always really confident in your own ability? Yeah, I, I kind of always felt confident that uh, once I made one team, I could make a, a, another one and another one as long as I just uh, uh, didn't muck around and just made made the most of it. Um, but um, yeah, when I got into the All Blacks, it was a whole other ball game. I, you'd always uh, wonder if you're good enough to be there because it's... It's the best of the best there, and um, uh, I think I struggled at first to try and uh, express myself or put my best foot forward because you're always wondering, uh, am I doing the right thing or is this? Uh, do I deserve to be here? But um, no, in terms of uh, 
uh, whenever I got the chance. I didn't really think too much about pressure. I just wanted to get the ball in my hand or do whatever I could to to to, to put my best foot forward. Mm. And so then you'd been in All Black and then you were coming back to the Blues to make your Blues debut, is that right? Yeah, it was, it was quite crazy. It's um, I kind of got, um, after the All Black tour and then I came back, I kind of got like the second year syndrome. I, uh, I played all right for the first uh, couple of games, but then I just got injury after injury. And uh, when, I, when I was fit, I wasn't playing well enough. And... And then missed out on the All Blacks for for a couple of years, but um, uh, to play my Blues debut was uh, that was another blessing and another dream come true because that was all it was always the team I wanted to play for, um, always wanted to be a Blues man, and uh, to get my debut there was was awesome. But uh, I was just kind of disappointed in myself that I couldn't uh, back up uh, what I'd previously done the year before and and how I was performing with the Auckland team. But uh, I guess it was a learning process for me to, whenever whenever you make a certain team, uh, that pre-season or whatever, that, that time off, you need to work as, twice as hard because there are other guys that want to take your spot. Yeah, 100%. And so you, you spoke a, bit, a little bit about injuries there because I know you had a fair few injuries early on in your career, like you mentioned, and uh, you, all, you missed out on the 2007 World Cup because of injuries. How hard was that to deal with, and how how did you cope with injuries throughout your career? Yeah, the injuries were a bit of a knock, but I always took comfort that <clears throat> a lot of my serious injuries were when I was young, younger, early twenties. Um, so I always took comfort that I had time, uh, time on my side to be able to rehab and, and to to get my best back. And yeah. um, so it didn't really. It didn't really take too much of a toll. It was just more of a, I, yeah, can I be as good as I was before when I get back? And that was a, it was always a motivating factor for me. But um, no, I kind of knew earlier on that I wasn't in the frame for that 2007 World Cup. So it didn't really hit me as hard as it would have uh, some other guys. Because I'd seen the depth that loose forward for the All Blacks at that time, and uh, it was crazy. So um, I kind of got my head around it uh, early enough before the team was even uh, uh, assembled. Yeah. I, was, I was competing with guys like Rodney Soyalo, Sione Lawaki, Chris Masoi, uh, Mosetu Ali'i, uh, Richie McCaw, and obviously the late uh, Jerry. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, and, and and they were playing awesome rugby at that time. So for me, missing out on that team wasn't much of a shock because I had nine, and I could see who was ahead of me, and and that's what I needed to work towards. And then you obviously did that work because the following year you almost cemented your spot into the All Black side after that. Yeah, well, it did help that uh, a lot of those guys had um, <laughs> kind of hung up their international boots and. Uh, <laughs> Did, did me a solid there, but um, it was um, it was just incredible to be accepted back into the training camp first, and then and then be uh, involved in the rugby championships or the Tri Nations, and then the uh, the rest of the end of year tours. Those were those were quite special, and uh, I guess for me getting in there in two thousand and eight, uh, the first challenge was to make sure that I could stay there for as long as possible, and. I was able to make a, a awesome combination with Richie and uh, Rito uh, a few years later, and um, was able to punch out a few good performances to to, to keep my name there. Did you what? What a trio! <laughs> <laughs> and then that obviously led you into the 2011 World Cup. Uh, talk to me about talk to me about this experience. Jeez, 2011 World Cup. Uh, it all went quite fast, but uh, there's one thing that sticks out for me during out that during that uh, tournament. It was just the pressure that was on our team. Um, yeah, being at home and just seeing uh, going down to the viaduct and just seeing uh, a sea of black and everyone getting excited about the tournament. For me, I was getting excited about it, but uh, just uh, that lingering feeling of man, we can't lose this. <laughs> <laughs> we can't lose here at home. And uh, I think that was always, uh, from the beginning to the end, that, that kind of feeling stuck with us. Um, yeah, 
so we always uh, we're always excited and and, and uh, looking forward to the tournament. But uh, that lingering feeling is uh, if we go all the way, we got to make sure that we we win this because uh, mm. we want to have to move uh, move countries and live somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Did you feel that pressure when you're out on the field, or is that just leading up to the game? No, it wasn't. Uh, none of that pressure was. Uh, there on the field, I'd say the only time I could feel it on the field was probably that last 10 minutes of the Rugby World Cup final. <laughs> yeah. That last 10 minutes just seemed to go on forever. And um, oh, I'll give it up to the French. They played uh, incredibly well that, that, that night. And it was, uh, I guess that's what added to the to the elation, to the, mm. to the final whistle going off, is that it was so tight. And... Uh, we were playing in front of our friends and families, which uh, which just uh, which just added to it, to it all. It was um, it was incredible. Some night, yeah. And the moment when the whole nation sort of stopped when Dan Carter got injured, how did that sort of affect the team? Did you did you honestly still feel feel like you guys could still win it when you started getting down to your fourth, fifth <laughs> choice ten? Man, we didn't. I didn't know we were doing lineouts on the other side of the field, so we didn't really know what was going on until um, Graham Henry blew the whistle and just called everyone into the changing rooms at uh, Rugby League Park there, um, and we all went into the sheds. And I think DC had gone with the doctors and the physios by then, and then yeah. Graham Henry wrote the news to the guys that um, DC's injured himself, and it uh, seems pretty serious. But uh, yeah, that feeling was just like what. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, I think it took us that night just to just think over things. But we always had confidence that uh, we we could um, still still play with the players that we had. We had some awesome backups and um, Aaron Cruden and um, Slady as well. Mm. But uh, when those two boys went <laughs> down and uh, and the mighty Beaver came in. <laughs> well, yeah, the boys were uh, the boys were like we could still do this, but uh, we just had to make sure that uh, um, whoever came in and it was Beaver that, at that time, we had to just make him feel comfortable and uh, um, get to know his role and our patterns as fast as possible because uh, yeah. the the final was fast approaching and uh, time was against us. But uh, I've known Beaver for a very long time and. I think he'd uh, he'd been dreaming and 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 playing for that very moment for a very long time. So I, I knew he was ready and he, he wouldn't let us down. But um, yeah, it was definitely an uh, interesting couple of weeks. That that. <laughs> Man, that's so cool. I love I love that story. Eh? How he, how Beaver comes yeah. in and kicks white the baiting. <laughs> white baiting after all the shit <laughs> that he'd copped throughout his career. It was awesome. Yeah. So cool. So how long, how long was he in the was he only in the side for a couple of weeks? Did he have to learn all the patterns for the, in like two weeks? I think it was less than a, was it? less than a couple of weeks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, he had to pick it up pretty quick. But um, no, he did well. I, yeah, I think it was less than a couple of weeks. All right, that is impressive. And a couple of moments in that World Cup that everyone remembers about you: a couple of massive tackles. You just manhandled. <laughs> Um, Shabal and I think Digby Ioane picking them up and just yeah. throwing them around like a ragdoll. How were those tackles? Because they're obviously a big ones on your highlights. Man, it didn't really uh, didn't hit me until after when you're watching the game over and, and then the boys are uh, talking about it. But um, yeah, it was, it was something that happened really fast and I didn't really plan or set out to do it like that. It's just the way it happened and uh, yeah. Oh, I'm glad it did because uh, <laughs> the, the the Aussies were definitely um, hitting their straps earlier on in their game. But yeah, those kind of situations, you don't really think too much about them. You just go get out there and do them. And mm. it's not until after you reflect and look back at uh, at what you did, and and sometimes you uh, you pinch yourself, and then other times you're just like a um, you know, it's just the, the way the team were feeling and how we were in the zone at that time. So what was your mindset going into a tackle? Because um, obviously you're known for your massive collisions, your big hits. How, how did you, what was your sort of mindset going into them? Because I'm sure it would have been completely opposite to mine. Man, um, 
earlier on in my Auckland days, so I was lucky to play with one of one of my best mates, uh, a good mate now, Sam Tutupo. Oh, and yeah. um, I used to always uh, ask him, well, what's his, well, what does he think when he goes into tackles? Because sometimes he goes and tackles guys uh, three times the size and he owns them. It was crazy, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I used to always ask him and he had to say, man, just don't think about getting hurt. If you go into a tackle thinking about getting hurt, then you're going to get hurt. He said, just go on with everything. Don't worry about, don't think about anything. Just back yourself. And uh, I always took that mindset because I, I I'm a lot bigger than him. And uh, I see how he just wraps guys. Uh, mm. um, and he just folds them backwards. So um, I, I kind of took that mindset. But um, yeah, uh, in, in those tackles with uh, during the World Cup, it was... For me, it was just trying to stop them or, or, or stop any momentum they had. Um, I, I, most of my career, I tried to take uh, Sam's mindset and not worry about uh, getting hurt, not worrying about uh, the outcomes, just getting in there and uh, closing my eyes and, <laughs> and wish for the best. <laughs> so how much of a tackle's technique and how much of its mindset you reckon? I reckon... Uh, Oof, I reckon 60% mindset, 40% technique. True, yeah. It might be more nowadays because I've seen some of my highlights uh, from a few years back and a lot of them will be borderline red card nowadays. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, true. And at the end of that World Cup, you were nominated for Player of the Year, one of the best players mm. in the world at the time. How, how did that feel? Man, it was uh, it was awesome. It was special to be uh, nominated. Uh, I felt quite lucky because majority of our team during that World Cup um, they really played well, and uh, mm. to be selected uh, in, a, in a in a in a group of players uh, throughout the whole tournament it was uh, it was quite a blessing. Um, I, I just felt like I fed off the uh, majority of the boys. Uh, being led by Richie, who was just uh, incredible, played majority of the World Cup injured, and was still still able to to lead the guys and and play the way Richie does. Um, yeah, so I felt quite lucky to be nominated amongst uh, some of those guys ahead of uh, a lot of guys in our team who I thought played really well. Yeah, did Richie tell you about his foot? Did you know about it? Oh, you kind of. You kind of knew about it, but he wouldn't talk about it. He, he'd say it's fine. <laughs> and uh, you, you saw him in the weight room and um, and uh, doing fitness. He'd, he'd do everything except for uh, some of the extras we do after training. He wouldn't uh, he wouldn't jump or anything just to to make sure of it. But you could see sometimes he'd be hobbling around the hotel and. Um, sure. You kind of questioned if he was all right, but uh, I was I was too scared to go up to him and ask him about it. But, um, he, he he didn't like to talk about it. Oh, that's classic. Then the move to Japan, I guess. So, um, what was the reason behind that move? Man, I needed another shoulder shoulder operation, which uh, kind of took me out of Super Rugby and uh, and All Blacks for at least another year and a half. So, um. For me to try and rehab in New Zealand and then, uh, build myself back up uh, during the off season, I thought, why don't I just rehab uh, now and then play a shorter, shorter season in Japan and try and get myself back to fitness and and also just an experience for my young family at that time. I thought it would be a, a great time to move. Also, a refresher after uh, that World Cup campaign, which was uh, was quite mentally draining. Yeah. Um, it, uh, I'm sure if you ask anyone that was involved in that, it was uh, it was quite a relief afterwards. It was more not a relief of winning; it was more a relief of not losing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I thought it would be a good experience for me and my young family to go over and experience something different while we still had the time. And and at that time, I. I was uh, rehabbing a few injuries and had a shoulder operation, which I thought was a perfect opportunity. Mm. And how did you find the Japan League over there? Man, it was quick. It was. Um, it wasn't what I expected. Um, they love to run. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Um, 
it was uh, it was a good experience. Great great club, great bunch of guys. Uh, I had to try and I had to work pretty hard to get used to the speed of the game over there. The the ruck contest isn't as much as it was at Super Rugby, which as a blindside flanker, you have to try and get around after the first ruck uh, to carry the ball, and uh, not many occasions where I'd be in the right place and and, <laughs> and, and make that ruck. <laughs> it, was, it was too quick, but um, it, was, it was a great experience, and um, I would always tell these you know, the boys about my first captain's run, where it was uh, wasn't your traditional captain's run that you get back in New Zealand. It was it was full <laughs> speed for an hour. <laughs> I was just, uh, I was just wondering how anyone would have the energy to play a game the next day. <laughs> oh, they do it differently, eh? Yeah, they, they love to run. <laughs> Is that why you came back? Too much running, or was it always the plan to come back? Yeah, it was always the plan to come back. I always, um, I thought I'd go over there and see how it goes and see how the experience is. And I absolutely loved the time there. And, um, but, uh, yeah, the itch was coming back to, to try and get back and play for the blues again and hopefully put my hand up to, to make the, the next world cup, which, um, which was always a goal of mine, which, um, yeah, which that was the motivation to come back and, and give it a good go. And let's talk to me about this world cup. How did this one compare over there? Oh, well, it was um, it wasn't as stressful as the one in New Zealand. Yeah, but uh, I guess the motivation was uh, on par. We we wanted to make sure that we proved everyone wrong. Everyone was saying that we couldn't win it uh, outside of New Zealand, and we couldn't do back to back World Cups. So, um, but for us, uh, the motivation was already set from uh, what everyone else was saying, and we wanted to make sure that we did something that no other team had ever done mm. did you always feel confident yeah I uh, yeah I was confident I knew that we had the team to do it but um, but there was always that lingering uh, history of all black uh, performances outside of uh, outside of New Zealand and um, also um, the possibility of facing the French in the knockout stages was always that uh, yeah, it was that nervous uh a feeling mm. and what was the final like oh it was incredible that was intense um that week uh just knowing that we're coming up against our arch nemesis in the final and uh it was kind of similar to the feeling that we had in um in 2 two eleven. um not wanting to let anyone down but uh yeah in 2015 we didn't want to lose but more importantly lose to the to the Wallabies in a, in a Rugby World Cup final. <laughs> True. Was the feeling after that game the same? Was it just a feeling of relief, or did this one you feel like you could enjoy it a little bit more? Yeah, I I, re- I think it was different to the feeling in two eleven. Uh, two eleven was more of a relief, a sigh of relief that we didn't have to move countries, and uh, two fifteen was more of a. Man, I can't believe we did it. Yeah, and uh, that was more of a we could we could really enjoy it and sit back and uh, and celebrate because uh, we had already known that uh, five of the legends on that on that team were going to play their last All Black game, so uh, that added to the motivation and also we could really enjoy it after that final whistle to to celebrate with those guys. Yeah, good. What were the celebrations like? Is it always a always a big do after a World Cup or? Yeah, it was quite. A, it was quite different that time. The, most of the boys we went back. To, we were staying at Penny Hill Park, and um, it wasn't anything extravagant. We had the families that night, and then the next day, we everyone just piled into. I think it was me and Dane Coles' room. Oh hell, that would have been would have been a bit of nigger in there. <laughs> yeah, we just piled in there, and honestly, it was quite tame. The boys were just sitting around playing the guitar, playing music, yeah. and uh, telling stories. So it wasn't. Uh, wasn't your usual big uh, team room team room gig yeah. um it was quite a i think one of the guys i think aaron smith took this uh, panoramic photo of us just piled into this one room and as uh for me that was that would be one of the best memories from uh the celebrations of that that world cup was just us just sitting back and and enjoying the the moment together but it was um boys didn't want to 
get too carried away because I think we had to be at the rugby world, uh, world rugby awards for that that next night. Oh, so um, yeah, so there was a lot to do before we left to come home. But um, yeah, that memory will stick out for me. It's just uh, being in there, me and Colsey's room with uh, most of the guys either sitting on the window sills, on the floors, and just uh, singing songs, which was cool. That is cool, and that's something that you look back on your rugby career eh, and you people always think about games, but as a player, you always just think about little moments like that. Just yeah, something so basic, just rugby world cup, but sitting in a room, yeah, all the boys just playing the guitar and just having a yarn. It's pretty crazy, eh? Yeah, and it's uh, being being in those com- campaigns, you don't really get those uh, opportunities too often to be able to sit back and, and have a beer and just chill out with the lads. Um, so, yeah, for me, uh, that that would be a, a memory that sticks out, uh, and I'll, I'll take that with me for forever. Yeah, so cool. And last thing I wanted to mention about your rugby career was the move to Toulouse. Was that what, – what was the reason behind this move? Um, I kind of knew that uh, – I was at the end of my tenure um, uh, with the All Blacks, but uh, with the Blues as well. I kind of there were a lot of uh, up and coming players, and uh, I didn't win any. I, I didn't really want to uh, overstay my my welcome, <laughs> so I kind of knew that I wasn't really up for international rugby anymore, and I needed. Uh, I kind of still wanted to play rugby, but just I didn't think that. Um, Playing in New Zealand would uh, would help me or even help the the younger players coming through. So, um, but I, I kind of needed something else in uh, Toulouse, and a couple of other clubs came uh, came knocking. Um, I was quite surprised that even another club came knocking for this old man. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was something that I always wanted to try out uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. But I'd. Uh, Spoken to a couple of mates who had already been to Toulouse, uh, Luke McAllister, Corey Flynn, and Emir Tialada. So I just spoke to them what Toulouse was like, and they, they all said positive things about the city and the club and and also the competition. So, um, yeah, I thought I'd make the move over and and hopefully give it a good go. Did you know you had as many years left as you did? Because, I mean, you ended up playing well into your late 30s, eh? <laughs> Yeah, no. Nah. I thought it would be a one or two year stint to come over and uh, yeah. and probably not even play um, a starting role just to to help the next few guys come through and and be a part of the team. But when I came over, I, the the coaches were still quite demanding of uh, how they wanted the team to play and and uh, and the performances. So for me, it was quite a surprise that. Uh, I came over and they didn't treat me as if uh, someone that was um, preparing for retirement. They still wanted me to push uh, the standards and push uh, push myself as hard as I could. And um, it helped me having a, a few of the boys over here already. Uh, Charlie Fumwina, Joe Takori, and also Peter Aki, who, um, who really helped the, the transition um, go as smooth as possible. But... Adding to that, we had some young up-and-coming French players and, and also some other South African players here who uh, pushed the standards of the team, which uh, me being an older guy, you you can't help but to, to try and uh, push yourself to meet those standards, yeah. uh, which uh, for me was, was awesome. The competitive edge gets you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want, don't want to drag the chain. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, the success you had last year, you got to finish your career with the the double, the Champions Cup and the top 14 double, which mm. I don't think many Kiwis would realise how hard that actually is. That Champions Cup is such a hard tournament to win. And I mean, I didn't never played in the top 14, yeah. but that looks like a tough tournament as well. Yeah, the top 14 in itself, it's uh, it's quite tough because you're playing each uh, each team twice home and away and... Uh, Every every game was uh, it's competitive, it's uh, it's physical, but then add in add in that the Champions Cup games in between, um, and the season gets quite long. But um, man, we're we're quite lucky that uh, the boys got up for most of those knockout games and were able to put ourselves in, a, in reach of a final, a semi final, and a final. And um, man, it just all panned out the way we we kind of. Uh, planned it and and wanted to work out but 
man, uh, not many people get to to say they they won a double um, with the top fourteen and the European Cup. And for me, being my last year, I was uh, I was quite grateful to to do that. Not many people get to finish on their own terms, uh, mm. but let alone uh, win win uh, the two two biggest ones here in France and Europe. And what and what are the crowds like? I mean, everyone talks about the French crowds as being just next level. What's it like there in Toulouse? Man, no, crazy here. And in the south here, most of the rugby supporters are really vocal and uh, they, they got numbers. We were lucky last two weeks ago it was our first home game with uh, with the full crowd. And oh, fair. We were out with the drums and singing the chants and. Um, Man, it's uh, it's incredible, and it, and it differs to every every uh, stadium and and city you go to because they always have their their own songs that they sing during the games and mm. um, yeah, some stadiums you find it hard to 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 hear yourself or even hear the calls because they're so vocal. But I think that's one thing that sets uh, French rugby apart from most is the the support that they get um, to most games. It's uh, incredible. It's awesome to see, eh? It gets, yeah. and as a player, you get so much energy from a crowd, eh? And it, I guess yeah. now that COVID sort of happened and some games don't have crowds, you can realise how much actual intensity a crowd brings to a game. Yeah, man. And uh, I guess uh, wherever you go, it doesn't matter what stadium you go to, they'll have a full crowd uh, most games, and that definitely adds to to those contests and how, how, um, how each team... Um, adds to, to to that to that occasion and um, yeah most of the games that we play here in the top 14 has a lot of intensity just because what the crowd bring to it how good is that and one thing i wanted to talk mm. to you about is your wee side hustle business the mint underwear one of the great <laughs> pairs of undies i've got a few pairs myself they're on rotation every single day um, what made you decide to set this up May we, uh, me and my best mates uh, bayon and rocky we um i think the first lockdown we had Went for a while, and we'd always have our WhatsApp group just chatting about um, about life and what we should do. And we we always wanted to create something together. It was just a matter of what. And um, and uh, I think m- most of us we always wanted to do something in our community uh, back at Papakura. Always wanted to give back, but uh, it was just a matter of how we could do it and why. And we went through so many ideas on what we should do. And um, I think. Uh, Rocky was the one who came up, or, or Bayon, uh, decided that uh, they struggled to find underwear uh, that, that fits perfectly for them. And uh, uh, we we chatted a few, for a few weeks and then settled on uh, why not make our own underwear for uh, all shapes and sizes and um, and uh, see how it goes. And, and for us, it's been been awesome to be able to create a product that uh, that's all inclusive mm. to all shapes and sizes, but also have a um, have a meaning and a movement behind it that uh, people and and men are able to tell their stories uh, behind their confidence in themselves or body confidence that uh, they've been able to deal with, and hopefully that our our company and our movement can add to to people speaking out about. Uh, uh, their journeys or their their issues that they've been facing throughout their lives. Love that. How much of a impact? How much of a say did you have on the design of them and stuff? Because it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd say Bayon Bayon and jo- Rocky would be the main uh, main uh, ones in the engine room. But uh, it's always it, it's always been pretty hard when you're not when all three of us are in three different countries and yeah. And uh, having to ship things all across the world to, to get feedback on it's um, uh, it's pretty tough. So I I kind of because I'm I'm the furthest away. I kind of let the boys uh, get all the materials and everything sent to them, and then I kind of trusted what they were uh, what they were dealing with. Uh, it would have been a lot easier if we we're all in the same country and we we're all able to, to brainstorm and 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 chat about things. But uh, yeah. it's the way the world is. But uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say too much of a say. I just kind of backed the boys uh, 
decisions and uh, and went with it. Mate, well, they absolutely nailed it. And they've come to the party with a 20% off discount too. Yeah. <laughs> Mint Lads is the promo code. If any listeners out there want to try these undies, they are some of the best undies I've worn. Chuck in Mint Lads in the promo code and you can have 20% off. It's, it's going to change your underwear drawer for sure. They even smell like mint, eh, when you open them. Yeah. What's what's that we touch? Uh, I think it's Bound. Bound and his uh, little magician daughter, uh, Valentina. I think she's the she's the mint uh, fairy <laughs> that uh, helps helps the undies smell like mint, which is a it's a good touch. Love it, mate. You're on fire. Anyway, mate, what a what a journey, what a career. We have gone to the Instagram for some questions to finish up. Um, oh, awesome. As you'd expect, thousands came in, so <laughs> um, I've just chosen a few. Uh, what is your world goat loose forward trio? Oh, that's a tough one. It is. I would have to. I would have definitely have to put Richie in there. He's uh, he's the goat. Mm. You can choose yourself too, by the way. No, 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 no. <laughs> Ooh. I would go Richie, Zinzan, and Michael Jones. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's hard to go past those guys, yeah. Like that. Okay, next question. Um, who was the most talented Blues teammate and why? Ooh. Most talented Blues teammate. Jeez, there was so much. There was. I'd say someone that kind of... Uh... I'll say Rapini, the other. Thought it might have been. He was freakish, eh? Yeah, he was a, he was a freak. Um, seeing what he was able to do on the field, but also some of the stuff that uh, wouldn't make TV that he did at trainings, it's just it's just freakish. Um, yeah, I'd say he'd be the most uh, X factor, but uh, that's amongst uh, some some other names there that I'll I'd have to go through probably ten yeah. or fifteen other guys that uh, yeah. were pretty pretty special. What was Rupini like as a trainer? Was he did he train hard or was he just freakishly gifted? Yeah, it was just all natural. I reckon he was, was so natural. Yeah, um, yeah, he did what he had to do, but uh, nothing, nothing too special. But um, what he was able to put out on the other field was uh, was incredible. Mate, he was so good. Eh? There was a passage there. What? Through maybe two or three years where he was just yeah. unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, what's the best advice for off-field personal development? Oh, what's the best advice for off-field personal development? I reckon don't limit yourself to, to anything. Um, to reach out to as many people as possible and uh, and, and find, find self-improvement from everywhere. Um, you know, you see a lot of guys, these uh, a lot of players these days, which for me, I, I learn from just from what they're doing. And, and 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 what avenues they're they're learning from? They're not restricting themselves to just uh, just sports. They're, they're looking elsewhere from business leaders, from from other avenues to to improve to get self improvement. So um, yeah, I'll I'd say just try and learn from as much people and from everywhere as possible. Geez, that's great advice. Mm. Like that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Would you play for Samoa at the 2023 World Cup if you could? If I could, I would. Yep, 100%. <laughs> if it was, if you were eligible, would you? Yep, oh, if I true. was eligible, I would. Wow. And if I wasn't uh, a 30-year-old, 30 38-year-old uh, <laughs> old man. <laughs> so if you if they did change the rules, would you would you push for it or nah? Too old now. Yeah, I'm too old now, but uh a younger me would definitely uh, give it a go. It would be a, be a dream come true. Yeah. What do you reckon they needed to do with those roles? What would what do you reckon is the best way forward there? I reckon they uh, they just need whatever country you want to play for. I just think they need a layoff period. Um, it would be two or three years uh, out of inter- international rugby and then you're eligible again because mm. – uh, Playing for sevens, playing for a sevens team and not playing international rugby, it's. I think that's unfair and and it doesn't help. Uh, doesn't help anyone to to exclude players who have just played a few tournaments of sevens. Yeah. And 
not being able to play another for another country. Mate, that sevens rule is yeah. an absolute joke. But what do you reckon about guys yeah. who've played for the All Blacks and then have, what, three or four years, like maybe like a Charles Piertau, yeah. etc. Do you think it would be cool Absolutely. to see him? Yeah. Yeah, I think if they had a layoff period, whether it was two or three years, and then uh, after that period, they're they're eligible to play for whoever they want. Mm. I think that's, uh, for me, I'd love to see that because there's so many players who have a lot to give to the international game, and yeah. uh, they aren't able to because of the rules. Mm. And some of those Pacific Island nations would be unreal if you could do that, eh? Some of them absolute. would be absolute world beaters. Yeah. Oh, interesting space. Anyway, next one. Um, how much did pure sport help you keep playing? Oh, man, it helped uh, helped a lot. Uh, I, I used to use a lot of anti-flams and, um, and a few painkillers to get through the, the last few um, years of my career. And um, uh, finding pure sport helped uh, with my knees. And, and also, as you'd know, I'm a, I'm a night owl. I struggle to sleep. Yeah. So um, I helped with inflammation in my joints, but also helped a lot with me uh, getting to sleep. So, you know, Pure Sport's been uh, been awesome, and I'll definitely be using it now that I'm all washed up and done. It's, uh, hopefully it would help me get into the gym. <laughs> Keep the joints moving, eh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, good stuff. Okay, next one. Uh, ha- who was your favourite player growing up? My favourite player growing up, I had a lot. I had a few. Um, I had Christian Cullen. Mm. Michael Jones and Carlos Spencer. Oh, yeah. What a trio. What was it like? What was Carlos like to play with when you ended up playing with him? Oh, he was so chilled out. He's a uh, cruisy, but um, yeah, just the, what he, what he, what you'd see on TV when I was growing up, he'd do the same at trainings, always trying new things. And, uh, but uh, incredible dude. So chilled out. Um, real, real cruisy. Okay. Last question. What's the best piece of advice you've received in your life? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I guess uh, my mum's one that she she used to always give me. It was, you always reap what you sow. So uh, mm. whatever you want to get, whatever you put into things, you'd always get out of it. So um, yeah, uh, you put in whatever you want to get out of things, uh, hard work or attention or whatever it is. Like that, that's very powerful way to finish the podcast, mate. You've come up trunks with a couple of great pieces of advice, but um, a absolute pleasure having you on the podcast, mate. What an incredible journey! Um, you're an all black legend, like I said at the start, so um, it's been awesome to sit down and go through your journey with you on the Waterlab podcast. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me, it's been awesome. Appreciate it, bro. Cheers, brother.